Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I apologize for the Philadelphia weather. Um, I think our request for good weather is in uh, God's junk mailbox. Um, it's my pleasure to um, moderate the panel on institutionalization and interdisciplinarity. Where do we locate the visual and the performative within the, within the academy? And we are joined today by a distinguished panel um, we have Diana Taylor from um, Hemi at NYU, um, Elmo Terry Morgan from Rights and Reason Theater at Brown University. Uh, on the screen, we have Faye Ginsberg, the Center for Media, History, and Culture at NYU, and then Annalise Riles, Anthropology and Law from Cornell. So welcome to all of you, and um, I'm going to be uh, ruthless about the time to keep us on schedule, um, but I'm looking forward to our conversation. So, if if uh, we'll start with at oh, I'm going first. Okay. Yes. I'll just uh, all right. So just tell me how we're doing our time. Okay. So so hi everyone. So um, thank you so much to Deborah Dershowitz and uh, Regina and others for organizing this morning's discussion. It was just fantastic and um, really exciting to me. So uh, so I I'm an anthropologist uh, who has been working mainly with lawyers and with technocratic institutions of various kinds throughout my career. And so you may wonder, what is my connection to all of this? Um, and it is that I'm now, at this point in my career, interested in doing something a little bit different. I'm interested in, actually, so the performativity that I want to bring to the table here is performing the ethnographic and the technocratic modalities of thought and practice in themselves as a kind of exercise. And, and, um, and where the purposes for doing so might remain very open, I suppose, and thinking about how those two might speak to each mm -hmm. other. And I think of this as a, um, a project that's really inspired by feminist theory and by feminist anthropology. I was trained in feminist anthropology. And um, one of the, I think, basic insights of feminist anthropology has always been that there's a tremendous excess beyond the text that comes out at the end of the ethnography, that, that the very reasons for which one entered into the field and what the field meant to us retro is often retrospectively somehow not quite there in the text. And so just over lunch, I had several conversations where I heard somebody say, well, this is really interesting to me, but it doesn't show up in my book. You know, so that kind of idea is what I'm, I'm talking about. And, and I think one of the really important pieces there for feminists was always the relations themselves and valuing them in, those, in themselves, if you like, as a kind of, dare we say, ethical commitment of a kind. 
Um, and, and in particular, the way those relationships engender a process of self-transformation or maybe reorientation um, entails in specifically in the act of becoming interested in and then maybe even empathetic to foreignness, however that foreignness may be conceived. You know, um, today we were just doing our little exercise for the next hour and we walked into the gallery and picked an object and tried to become empathetic towards that object. And I think that kind of reorientation is just fundamental to ethnography. So, so when, I, when I speak about ethnography, what I'm specifically talking about is a kind of risk-taking practice. It is risky, you know, even humiliating, right? Um, in, t in which there's also a dimension of incomprehensibility and confusion caused by the very excess of the field, that things don't come at you in neat categories and there's all this stuff going on. And that through that process, certain kinds of incongruent connections emerge that are ultimately self-transformative -trans for the ethnographer, first of all. So that's the ethnographic piece. And then I'm also interested in performing what I think of as the technocratic. So this is what my informants, the people we used to call informants, do, right? The lawyers, the bureaucrats that I work with. And for them, one of the main tools of thought is what's called means ends reasoning. So in almost every field, thinking instrumentally. Um, and it sounds very dry, but what's, fast, what's always fascinated me about all the technocrats that I've ever worked with is that there is an excess to means ends reasoning too. That is that the means often overtake the ends, or the means come to foreground, get foregrounded, and the ends get backgrounded. So a lawyer might say to you, I work, you know, why do I work for Goldman Sachs? I work for Goldman Sachs to pay my co kids college tuish tuition. But let me tell you about this really cool thing I invented, right? So the way in which the thing, the tools themselves overtake the ends in, in, in daily life, the excess of the means over the ends. Um, and so I got interested in instrumentalism itself as a kind of controlled fiction or practice or, that is performed and how that might be in conversation with ethnography. So, so I guess the connection to the larger conversation we're having here, what I felt really like I wanted to cheer about this morning um, was the idea, can ethnography take some other form than as a prelude to a text? Um, and, um, but then the, the question that was also raised on the panel this morning, that once one does that, one produces genres that are not recognizable as such. That is, they don't necessarily sound like serious projects. Um, and, um, and what I want to suggest here in response to that thought that maybe, which I think was the point of this panel, was to talk about what to do about the fact that we're not taken seriously, is that I think that that itself can be a tremendous ethnographic opportunity. That it's similar to the process of submission that you go through as an ethnographer in any field situation, which is not being taken seriously. I always tell my, uh, you know, and, and, and in, in a sense, the abeyance of our own expertise, our expert agency can be quite productive. And I also think of that as a very feminist point. I always tell my, you know, I'm always asked, you know, how can you do field work in Japan with central bankers when they don't take women seriously and you were really young when you did your ethnography, it must have been horrible. Yeah, it's horrible not being taken seriously, but it's a tremendously fabulous ethnographic tool, right? Because the people who do take you seriously are incredible people, right? And, 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 and so there's actually an incredible value, I think, in that situation of, of discomfort. So, but I guess the difference from perhaps what we talked about this morning is that for me, what, what ethnogra the form that ethnography is taking is not so much a film or a, um, um, a, a play or anything like that. It's a global institution. What I'm interested in is what, what if ethnography could be something completely different? What if it could be an alternative to the university? What if it could take some totally other form? Okay, so the project that um, I'm involved in now is called Meridian 180, and um, its origins date to the very end of a 10-year ethnographic project that I did in Japan and also an earthquake. Um, you know, there was an earthquake in Japan in 2011. It was a very, very difficult time for anyone who lived through that uh, professionally, personally, and just about every, existentially at every level. Um, a nuclear crisis. And, um, and I, uh, I, along with uh, my uh, informants of 10 years, experienced an absolute shattering of intellectual confidence. The question was, why had we not thought about this? Why didn't we know this was, could happen? Why did we not think about energy? You know, all these things. Why was I not interested? Back to this issue of interest. Why, 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 why was this not on any of our radar screens, right? And, um, and this sounds perhaps, um, you know, 
facile, but um, you know, just to talk about that in the abstract, but for the people who I worked with who were experts, whose job was to manage the global economy, to manage the state, this was so severe that you know, it really uh, became a, a point of, you know, I mean, one person called me and said, you won't see me again because I'm gonna drink myself to death this weekend. You know, there was a sense that there's nowhere to go. And, um, and at, at, at that point, we began to, I, I began to ask myself, what does ethnography have to offer in these kinds of dark moments when you really are facing the limits of your own expertise? You are as an ethnographer and they are as subjects. And, um, and I began to think that perhaps we could have some kind of an ethnographic form of engagement with, whose purpose was simply, frankly, to allow us to live side by side the limits of our own thoughts and our own, our own tools. Um, this project has grown since the earthquake into um, a, uh, I guess you would call it an institution. We have 700 members. Um, two thirds are academics, one third are policymakers, lawyers, practitioners. Predo the academics are predominantly lawyers, but, and anthropologists, and then finance people, and then we have STS, gender studies, just about everything else, theologians, artists, all kinds of people. 29 countries, but predominantly Asia Pacific Rim, and the conversation takes place in four languages always. So the linguistic dimension, I think, is also very important to me as an ethnographer, the, the, the process of thinking through a question in multiple languages. Um, and um, we, I can talk more about the governance if that's of interest to people, but I think I will not now. But, but, um, but our format is to have uh, online and live conversations in which we choose topics about which we feel there's a limit to our own, our own ability to even think the questions. And then we ask people to do something with those questions which seems familiar to them at first but turns out not to be. So we ask them to attend a conference, we ask them to make comments online, but then we deny them a lot of the expert tools for doing that. So no footnotes, very short comments, you won't get any publicity out of this, you can't use your name, you can't benefit from it, we're not gonna put it on a website, you can't put it on your resume. And we do, we do everything we can to try to make, take away the, the, uh, the idea that there could be an output of some value to you in doing this, right? So it's like we're performing our expertise, we're performing the means without any possible ends for doing it. Um, and the style of the conversation is cerebral and very intense and risk-taking. We ask people to deal with questions that are outside their disciplinary focus. Um, but, so it's very different from other online things that you might imagine, like blogs or things like that. But it doesn't have a lot of the, the trappings or benefits of, of academic work. Now, um, one of the questions that the panel raised, what, the panel question, uh, uh, abstract raised, was. What are the methodological and what are the theoretical stakes? And for me, methodologically, um, I, it comes out of uh, the study, the ethnographic study of experts, and in my case, lawyers, but I think a lot of the ethno ethno ethnography of the contemporary now faces a similar problem, which is the language and, and knowledge practices, the, 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 the pathways, the genres, the tools of ethnography, of, of one subjects of the world are imperceptibly close to our own as ethnographers and absolutely t intertwined with them. This is, I think, what the term paraethnography is trying to get at. Um, and it creates this pitfall, which I see a lot of my graduate students face, which is that uh, we, what we used to call in the old days the confusion of emic and edic, right? That there's st you're not really sure whether it's your categories or their categories that you're dealing with anymore. Um, and um, and our thought is to take that to the next step as performance by saying, we're actually gonna allow these things to merge into each other. We're going to enter into a space in which that divide between the informant and the anthropologist just doesn't exist anymore and we're actually making concepts together. We're gonna to knowingly merge these things, knowing that that's actually quite problematic in and of itself. Um, and now, um, Theoretically or politically, I think this is significant um, for, for several reasons. Um, in the world that I inhabit as a law professor, the dominant modality of thought is, or, or, or self-identity self as, a, as a law professor or as a legal academic is, is that you imagine yourself as a kind of expert advisor to the king, right? You're the person who provides advice. You have some deep knowledge about something and the, the regulators or whoever, the judges should listen to you and you should tell them what to do. 
And as an ethnographer, that just seems like a totally crazy thing to me to do, but it's a modality that I must inhabit in order to be in that position. Um, and so I've always found it quite interesting to be in a space that I find just totally impossible in that way. But what's interesting at this moment is that the very, the contradictions are weighing down so heavily on that role among the experts themselves that they too are starting to feel that it's crumbling and they're not quite sure what to do. Now on the flip side, on the anthropologist side, I think the anthropologists imagine often that their role is to be the anarchist critic, right? So stand on the outside and throw bombs or whatever. And that also is a role that I always find somewhat problematic to inhabit because I live also on the other side. And, you know, and, and I think it's, there's a, uh, that is also a role which now is finding itself weighing down with so many contradictions, so, so many internal tensions that it becomes difficult to bear. And so then the question becomes, what is left for us as a subject position and as a modality of action after either expert knowledge and the modality of advisor to the king or critique, right? What comes next? Um, that we need some other modality of engagement, some other way to go forward. And it seems to me that the only way that that's going to come to be is through some sort of performative space in which we and they meet in a, a mutual acknowledgement of the dark side, the limits of our techniques and tools. And that's what Fukushima was for me. So, so then the last question that the, pan the panel organizers asked us to address is how to translate all of this into concrete institutional support, I think was the question, right? So how to make this all uh, somehow um, uh, uh, doable? And, and um, I guess my response to that is, you know, again, I've had a career of for 20 years being both a law professor and an anthropologist sort of running back and forth. I mean, it's almost hilarious. The first, first job that I had I gave job talks in both departments on the same day, and I was literally changing outfits as I was running from one department to the other, like taking off the suit, putting on the ethnic scarf while I was thrashing. Them. So, so um, yeah, two minutes got it. So, so um, and my response to that has always been that there's tremendous power in a kind of letting people have a creative misunderstanding of what one is doing. And to me, that's part of what I heard in the talk about performance today, that the performance space is a space in which creative misunderstandings can be celebrated and used in some way. And so my response to the institutional question is, again, to allow for a kind of, I guess this is my sort of queer theory piece, but a kind of creative misunderstanding, a misunderstanding that is plausible, but ultimately in some ways flawed, and let that also be out there as a kind of experiment. So my dean imagines that what I'm doing is building a new global institution, right? You know, I mean, and that's plausible understanding. There are 700 people from 30 countries in this group. So yeah, right? So whatever. Now the problem is that there will be points at which the tensions become um, really apparent and impossible to, to maintain anymore. And I found that foundations are really good at sniffing out what's really going on. They don't believe this for a second, right? So, and so the phrase that we often get back to grant proposals is, you're neither fish nor fowl. I just love that phrase. You're neither fish nor fowl. So, because you're mixing too many things. You've got to, which I, to me is what ethnography is. It's neither fish nor fowl. You're in the field and things are coming at you from all these directions. And that we're trying to recreate that so it looks unclear. It doesn't look like a real institution. And that's challenging and, and difficult. But um, I know you want me to stop, so I will. Um, so, um, but what I have found is that whereas foundations don't buy it, the members themselves, the people who are part of the performance find tremendous value in it. And it is they who are moved and changed by this experience, and it's they who, have, who actually are willing to mobilize whatever resources they can to make things happen. So I think maybe one response to the, to the, the question of how to deal with the institutions is to say, we are right here. In the, we are the institution, and, and we have the ability to make things happen if we understand what it is. Um, and that's that's... Um, that's how we've survived as a project. Um, um, I, I think I'll just close by saying that I think the ultimate question for, for this project is for me the, it, this, a version of this institutional question, which is how does something, how is interest in something foreign or unfamiliar ultimately generated? And how does that interest in, how does my interest in you and the things about you that I don't understand come to change me. And I think that's the basic humanist project, which is the core of anthropology for me. <laughs> um, and it's the piece that, it, 
and the challenge of getting institutions to hear these projects is just another version of the work of doing that question itself. And so we shouldn't think of the institutional question as a side question or something that's uh, something you have to do to get on with the creative work. It is the creative work itself. Am I next? Okay, you're next. Okay. Um, could you just remind me what the time frame is? How, how long do I have? Sorry? Sorry. Oh, okay. 15 minutes. 15 minutes? Okay, great. Um, so, uh, hi everyone. Sorry I can't be there. Um, I, I have to be in New York because my daughter's medical status, but I also have a horrible cold. So, you're probably happy I'm not there sneezing on you. Anyway, uh, I very much appreciate the invitation and the conference's uh, willingness to insert me in through this Skype, um, and especially to uh, Deb and John and Gabriel for all their guidance for this. Uh, it looks like a wonderful crowd. I'm getting some feedback. Are you hearing it? Yeah. Okay. So um, I'm very delighted to be on the panel addressing institutionalization and interdisciplinarity and the uh, visual and the performative within the academy. Um, I'm sorry I can't be as fluidly connecting up to what happened prior to this since I wasn't there, but hopefully it'll, may, it'll mesh. So I'm gonna talk about, I'm assuming this is what you wanted me to talk about, something I've been working on for almost three decades, which is um, the graduate certificate program in culture and media at NYU that I started here uh, 28 years ago when I was 10 years old, just kidding. Um, <clears throat> and, but it was right after I got my PhD and I was invited at the time by um, the chair of anthropology, Annette Weiner, uh, and uh, also the chair of cinema studies, Brian Winston, if people know him, a very distinguished scholar of documentary as well as a director of those things. Um, and they were both really interested in ethnographic film and they w wanted to try and work together to start a program and they about me because I was in New York and I was doing a lot of work with film and people. Anyway, I sort of got in front of their vision and um, asked me to start it. They really didn't know what they wanted to do. That's kind of an institutional advantage. Two things, they didn't really, they weren't sure and also they didn't have very much money. So it was really great because then someone very junior like I was at the time um, could step into that and the expectations were kind of not clear since they really weren't sure what they were doing, but I had a lot of ideas. So it was really a wonderful opportunity. Um, it was a period in the 80s, it was in the late 80s, um, when the anxieties of influence around anthropology and other modes of expert knowledge and also critiques of the colonial camera were very prevalent. So um, I asked them if I could avoid the patronizing connotations of a title like ethnographic film. And what I saw is the problems of the segregation of the field of visual anthropology, which when it was attached to other academic departments tended to be its own little ghetto. Um, and I was also concerned that we'd not think about media as only being visual. So that's how we ended up with the name culture and media, which is about as big as you can get, I guess. Um, to date now, over 180 people have successfully completed the program. Uh, they come either through the graduate program in anthropology, those are all PhD students, or in cinema studies who are PhD and master's students. And then we have a few sneaking in from programs like media, culture, and communication and some other fields. Anyway, about 180 people have done these, uh, done the program, which means that they have um, learned the critical history of cross-cultural filmmaking over the last century they up into the very present, develop sophistication in the ethnographic study of media across the globe. And these range from uh, the study of video projects in the Amazon to Bollywood film industries to um, Maori television, Mapuche use of social media, cell phone films in Arnhem Land, uh, quite a, a wide range. What um, we call here Media Worlds, it's the name of the book that my former colleague at NYU, Lila Bulagod, and at that time our student, Brian Larkin, who's now also at Barnard, uh, used as the title for our edited collection, which was an effort to kind of plant the flag over um, uh, on the field and to say, in fact, anthropology needs to be looking at media. We need 
to be using much more ethnographic kind of approach to looking at it. There's so much stuff that falls off the radar, radar of what uh, the dominant media industries imagine to be media. Things have really changed very, very rapidly. But at the time when we were putting that book together, which was in the early 21st century, those were not so obvious. Um, so they very much characterize the kind of approach that we take here in terms of research. Uh, finally, everyone in our program, <clears throat> excuse me, and they, uh, as I mentioned, they're all graduate students in anthropology or cinema studies, uh, also makes a documentary film their last year of coursework. Our production course pushes them to be uh, very strong on story, as strong as they are on technique, and also with a collaborative approach um, and a self-conscious uh, concern with both the excellence of their work and the ethics of it as well, uh, thinking about what we used to call the politics of representation, distinguishing the work that comes out of our program. The first audience that their work reaches uh, will usually be many of the people who are in their films, and I always feel like that's one of the most important ways to keep people honest and one of the ways that introducing the visual and that kind of practice into the academy um, you know, plays a very important role. Uh, it's very different to write about people when they're at a great distance from you and they're reading what you write. Uh, and, uh, of course, that's increasingly changing, but it's really particularly um, compelling and keeps you very honest to know people are going to be sitting there watching the representations that you make of them. <clears throat> um, additionally, and I, I don't know how many of you are out there are familiar with other visual anthropology programs. Excuse me. <clears throat> We don't have a house style that marks the films that get made in some of the other programs. So, for example, in Manchester, they're well known for the observational approach. Or in Harvard, they've um, kind of branded their orthodoxy that they call sensory ethnography. Um, and we really take a very different approach. So in the very first seminar, students become familiar with the range of styles and techniques that have been used over the last century. And the paradigmatic works that define the field and are made aware of uh, we, one of the ways that indigenous media got introduced into our program very early on was um, just to be sure that students recognize that um, everybody can hold a camera now. They may not want you to come in and make representations to really be very mindful of the appropriateness of walking into a space with a camera and what that might mean. And maybe that's not the way you should be approaching it. <clears throat> Uh, excuse me for one second. I'm just <clears throat> feeling the effects of my cold medicine. I just have to get some water. Pardon me. <clears throat> okay. Uh, okay. Um. Okay. Um, in addition, we um, are very fortunate to be in New York City because we take advantage of all the uh, a lively and creative institutional surround beyond the university. So all of our students work in their very first semester on the Margaret Mead Film Festival. Um, so they're immersed in a range of recent work and meeting contemporary filmmakers. Um, I work as one of the curators on the festival every year, so we're increasingly doing installation work. We have introduced as of three years ago sessions that we call culture labs where we're looking at how people are working on and off screen with all the different kinds of media practices so there's just a lively sense of being inserted into a world beyond the academy uh, and looking at the kinds of experiments that people are doing these days <clears throat> um, let's see where i want to go uh, um, so i just was going to mention like some of the kinds of films that students make um, uh, enter into their research practice at all. In fact, a, a number of them have started calling uh, the film project a kind of passport into their into field work. Um, I'll just mention a few. Um, some of them I know have shown in the Philadelphia area. Um, Teresa Montoya's film Doing the Sheep Good is a beautiful, reflexive account of her efforts to bring um, films made by novice Navajo filmmakers in the 1960s with the famous Saul Worth experiments brought those back to the original filmmakers in Pine Springs. The films had basically disappeared from the Navajo reservation. Um, and the film is a wonderful chronicle of her journey back there, bringing the films back, meeting some of the filmmakers, and discovering her own kinship relations with people. And just kind of a meditation on the transformation of uh, and responsibilities of carrying a camera. Um, Natasha Raheja's film, Made in India, which um, uh, she uh, premiered last year at the Margaret Mead Film Festival, follows the journey of 
manhole covers on New York streets that are stamped with the phrase Made in India. She got the idea for her film walking across the street when she looked down and said, why does it say Made in India? And she actually tracked down the factories in India and hung out with um, the the people making those manhole covers for about a month during January made a really remarkable film that like the a kind of what I call a follow the thing film. Um, and another one, just I'll mention these three, uh, Christy Melodic's uh, film Living Quechua is a portrait of Elva Ambia, a New York based Quechua speaker who single handedly cultivated Quechua speaking communities in New York City. Um, a project that grew out of um, Christie's uh, Quechua podcast series that she makes with some some other uh, Quechua students in the city going around and discovering who's speaking Quechua, reporting their stories and making them available. So um, finally, our students have become positively evangelical as they're now in positions throughout the U.S. and beyond as academics, filmmakers, and cultural activists. Um, we're a program, it, we're, we're old enough to have a couple of generations out there at least. So they're in places like Harvard, Berkeley, Chicago, Irvine, Barnard, Bard, I could just this along with uh, Tufts, others. Anyway, I'm now competing with my former students for uh, graduate students, which is kind of a nice feeling. Um, but they're, they are um, also setting up similar kinds of programs that cross over between media anthropology, both in terms of production and research. Um, hold on, I'm just looking at my notes here. So um, I wanted to mention a few things just about what my, you know, what kind of provoked me into doing this. And I had I had worked in a uh, documentary before I started graduate school, and I had the opportunity to study with a French anthropologist and filmmaker, Jean Rouche. I don't know if people are familiar with him. Okay, and um, I see some heads nodding, and so I'm, some of you know. Uh, anyway, he was a very wild and woolly guy, a very uh, inspiring teacher, but most importantly, what I really learned from him was the way that film can open up the possibility of what he would call anthropologie partagée or shared anthropology. And this was again in the 50s. So actually it's interesting because uh, some of the things Annalise was talking about as um, uh, ethnography's excess, I think, were the things he was trying to think about, but also to think about how um, something beyond sort of written academic text can be an opportunity for jointly jointly shaping representations. I'm so sorry, I couldn't hear what, I heard a big noise, but I don't know what that was. Okay. Um, so the, um, you know, I think that, that the question of, of being able to capture some of the kinds of um, parts of ethnography that you really can't be captured in the text and to have that opportunity to really work together with people on a joint project of representation is sometimes is touted as a very new thing. It's not such a new thing, but it hasn't really been engaged as fully as I think it could be. So it's one of the things we really uh, try and think about in our program. <clears throat> um, um, I really, I appreciated it very much when I was actually did my very first field work project uh, in Fargo, North Dakota with women on both sides of the abortion debate. Um, and also felt the, the passport question, because I think I, if I had come into that community first as an anthropologist, no one would have talked to me. Um, who's this person from New York? Why should I spend time with them? You know, they, we are sure they don't understand what we do. But when I came in with a camera um, and offered them the opportunity to be involved in their own representation, I was very, uh, I was welcomed into places that I think I would not have been welcomed into otherwise. Um, Additionally, I was working for at that time for a television station. So that when the when the documentary screened about their lives, I was um, really uh, in the hot seat because I knew if they didn't like the film, I couldn't go back and complete research there. But fortunately, people were uh, comfortable with their own the complex representations of women on both sides of the debate there, and it also captured the feeling of the place that's hard to get across in an ethnography, like watching people protest in front of a clinic and when it's 20 below zero for weeks on end and things like that. <clears throat> so um, how am I doing on time? You Sorry. Have two minutes. I have two minutes. Okay, great, because I'm just gonna sort of. Um, I hope I'm touching the kinds of points that people are interested in hearing. Um, hold on one second. I guess uh, what I want to say is we've been, in terms of institutional support, um, I've been very fortunate because there's been a lot of interest. This program was was something that helped distinguish NYU's anthropology program from other places. And so the various um, 
chairs that we've had have uh, been very tolerant of it. Um, I've also gone after foundation money to help amplify and build the program. In 1993, I got Rockefeller money to start the Center for Media, Culture, and History. And that um, allowed us to bring in really lively and interesting fellows who stretched the boundary of the academy to activists and uh, artists and um, a range of people who who, you know, it really brought a very creative kind of sensibility to the work, but also gave us support for a lot of public programming that would uh, stretch the range of work students could be exposed to. Um, in 2003, we um, received, we were actually invited by Pew Charitable Trust to start a Center for Religion and Media, which is ongoing. And so that's been a whole new research um, initiative. We've had fellows, we've had working groups from that range from, um, um, things like human rights, um, indigenous cosmologies, um, uh, Christianities, a whole, you know, a whole range of different kinds of projects, and many of those have helped launch student projects. Um, in 2005, we did a big project with the Museum of American Indian and MoMA called First Nations First Features, where we brought 20 indigenous filmmakers from all over the world to show their first feature film. Um, and that very much emerged out of work that I had been I've been doing for a number of years, but um, each filmmaker who came had a grad student attached to them to keep the, to sort of, you know, mind, help mind, mind them, help look after people when they're in the city for the first time. And I think we got five PhD projects resulted out of those relationships because people got to have that first opening. But it also helped introduce that work and put it on the map of um, important film work in, this, in the city. Um, Finally, uh, work I'm currently doing, which is very involved in looking at um, the transformation of disability since the ADA, the last 25 years. Uh, we're doing, we're looking at, I'm working with a partner and we're looking at sites of innovation. Um, and one of those is of course media. So I've helped actually in doing the research, I call this method the Mobius strip because it's kind of hard to know where the inside and the outside are, you know, the figure of the Mobius strip, there's no inside or outside. Um, so I started talking to people about films and before I knew it, I was helping start a film festival. We just finished our seventh iteration of that. Uh, it's called Real Abilities and um, NYU is an offsite um, screening center for that. But we've actually developed 37 sites throughout the city to into these are works by, for, and about people with disabilities. Um, the second to the last night, we actually showed a film about um, disability activism in immersive worlds. And we had um, a discussion that took place both in the audience and um, with 40 avatars gathered in Second Life to amplify that discussion in cyberspace. So that's it's been a kind of fun way that we're extending into digital worlds. So I think I'm kind of running out of time here. But anyway, we're, we, we just keep um, trying to expand the range of the ways we think about media, you know, back when we started almost 30 years ago, I mean, it seemed like a radical thing to include media and anthropology. It doesn't seem so radical anymore. In fact, it seems very necessary. Um, so fortunately we've had, um, you know, a lot of, we've had a lot of support for the work that our students are doing and a lot of support for the range that, of stuff that we're, you know, we do have to go after foundation money and other forms of support. We collaborate a lot. Um, Diana Taylor, who's there somewhere, uh, and I collaborate on support mutual projects, the disability project is something that's on her radar, radar as well at the Hemispheric Institute. So um, I hope that uh, covers the ground that you wanted to hear about. And I uh, look forward to hearing the rest of you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, hello and thank you and thanks to Deb and Gabe and other people who uh, made this possible. I'm going to talk about three kinds of moments um, in my career in terms of discipline. Disciplinary uh, kind of breaking for me into a different area. And the first was getting into performance studies. I know that some of you, uh, E. Patrick, I don't know who else is in the performance studies department, but um, for those of you who are, you know that uh, it's very difficult to pinpoint performance studies down. I think of it as a post-discipline. I think of it as um, a set of methodologies and critical ways of applying critical lenses that come out of a whole slew of disciplines, but is not in and of itself a discipline. 
so that for me is incredibly exciting to be able to break into this other area that has, in my uh, experience, freed me of the disciplinary boundaries uh, within which I was trained. And that's great. I mean, I, it's not that I don't like disciplines, but I like this way of being able to think about more complex objects of analysis and to pull from all sorts of different places. Um, being a post-disciplinary or whatever performance studies is, is a challenge in institutional ways. Performance studies at NYU was the first performance studies department. And what happened there, as the story goes, was that some of the faculty from uh, the graduate school of the drama department went up to talk to the dean and said, listen, we don't do drama anymore. We do this thing that we think of as performance studies. We would like to have our own department. And the dean then said, great why don't you have your own department? And you'll be a graduate department, and drama will be undergraduate, and that's perfect. Well, that was completely perfect, except that, as everybody in the world knows, you don't fund a graduate department without an undergraduate. And there has been a big brouhaha since the day performance studies got started because there was no funding source for it. So. Um, when I went into performance studies in 97, I went in as chair, and part of, my part of my project was to try to figure out how to make this self-sustaining. And I spent years, you know, trying to convince the dean of different things we could do, uh, none of which helped. Now, of course, the inevitable has happened, which means that we are now starting this next year our first undergraduate class. So some 35 years after the founding of performance studies, we have to go back and start an undergraduate class in performance, in performance studies. So it's going to be exciting, and I'm very happy about it. But um, being a post-disciplinary department poses all sorts of other kinds of problems that we can talk about, it. challenges, I prefer to call them. But like, for example, we don't have a canon. Right? What do you read? What's your exam list? Who's on it? Right? Well, it depends how you think about performance studies, and there's lots of different ways of doing that. So the second thing I want to talk about is that once in performance studies, in, when I got there in 97, um, I thought that the conversation about performance studies, not just the critical theory in general, was very Anglo. That is, it was written in English, and it was written basically in the US, the UK, and Australia. All fabulous work. But I thought it would very, be very important to open up the conversation north-south and to actually involve people uh, from Latin America, the US, and Canada. I'm from Mexico. For, for me, there was a huge political, ethical, and whatever investment, epistemic investment, in trying to get these different um, ways of thinking about all sorts of embodied practices into some kind of conversation together. And I started the Hemispheric Institute of Performance and Politics in 1998, so the year after I got to NYU. Now, HEMI, as we now call it, is, I don't know, 17 years later, a very large um, project. And it's basically a network of 45 universities from throughout the Americas and about 25 cultural centers. And we work together in all sorts of different ways and consider ourselves basically itinerant or mobile because we're either working in different parts of the Americas and moving it around, or we're working digitally. But we're really not that mobile, I mean, in one way, because we need institutional support. So this is where institutions come back uh, to play a big role in something that imagines itself to be post-institutional. I mean, my way of thinking of HEMI has been post-institutional, but it's really, really not. I mean, not if we think about it in terms of what it takes to be that. And what it takes to be that is you need institutions. So the home institution for HEMI is NYU because that's where I work and that's where I started it. Um, but I started it with other institutional members. And the reason that we went to institutional members rather than just say individuals was that we thought at the time that building something that we hoped was going to be America's wide in scope 
and that was going to be able to give room for us to teach courses together, share materials, which meant archives, um, share teaching platforms and digital things, which meant money. I mean, all of these things take resources. Now, universities usually have a huge number of resources, even uh, schools that are not so well funded. They have an infrastructure, they have internet, they have all sorts of things that tend to get turned inwards for the student body, for the faculty. This way, we chose to turn them outward and we use them to connect everybody to everybody. So that became really fantastic. But um, in order to do this, as I was saying to Deb earlier today, two things happened. One was I didn't want to get NYU permission to do this. So that meant there's an expression in Spanish, but I think we have it in English too, that's better to ask for forgiveness than to ask for permission. So um, Hemi went under the wire. We got our first grant in 1998 from the Ford Foundation, and they've continued to grant uh, to fund us um, uninterruptedly since then. We got our last grant last night. And um, so that has been an incredible source of support for us. And Rockefeller and uh, Mellon and lots of other wonderful foundations have been incredible. But um, so we started getting enough money before NYU realized what was happening. And then when they realized what was happening, then they decided that they were gonna have to try to do something about it. Um, and so by this time, it was getting to be a big drain on my time and on my uh, energy because I was chairing performance studies and I had to fundraise. So with like the staff positions I needed, I had to, fund I had to fundraise for everything. So finally, um, it got to be too much of a burden and I started talking to NYU about different kinds of support. And uh, finally, we became a provostial institute. So that means that uh, the provost took us under his kind of wing. He set up a floor called the provostial institutes that we share with a couple of other, um, a couple of other institutes. And we get funding for the space and we get funding for four staff lines and I do the fundraising still for all of our programming. And now, as I said, it's a very, very big deal. We have a huge uh, digital video library where we have over 600 hours of streaming video performance from throughout the Americas. That's continuing to grow. We grow at 100 hours a year. So that's um, doing very well. We have a physical archive, which we call the Archive of Last Resort, which is, um, we envisioned it as the anti-colonial archive. So instead of uh, you know going and seeing precious pieces from different parts of the world, you know, in museums in the U.S. or in Germany or whatever, we don't want to own anything. But if artists feel that their materials will be destroyed or not cared for in their home countries, and they've exhausted all possibility of keeping them in their home countries, then we'll take them so that they don't get uh, destroyed. So that's why we're the artist of uh, the act, sorry, the archive of last resort. We're also like uh, your project, multilingual. We have four working languages: Spanish, English, Portuguese, and French. And we have a whole series. We have now Hemi Press, where we do publications, and we have all sorts of uh, print book publications as well in many languages and a digital journal called Hemisferica. So that's been a really kind of huge thing that just gets bigger and bigger and bigger because there's more and more people that get involved. We get together every two years. This last year was in Montreal. Next year, it's going to be in uh, Santiago de Chile. And we have about 1,000 people that participate in each of these get-togethers. And then we have things that are going on all year. So that's been a wonderful complement to performance studies. And I think now NYU really does see it as a resource for performance studies and for the rest of the university because we work closely like with Faye and with libraries and with lots of other people at NYU. So that's been a really a wonderful um, um, kind of a crossover into this other format than the university. Now, I don't know if this is a model for a different kind of a university. I always dream of being part of an open university, of uh, not having to cater just to a certain population or in a certain country or in a certain language. I teach a course as part of the HEMI project every year. This one, it's going to be in Chiapas 
in July, and it's on migration and human rights. You know, we're in the middle of this incredible political crisis of hundreds of thousands of migrants coming from Central America into the U.S. and Canada, and there's uh, about 200,000 people have been killed or disappeared in the last eight years. So it's a major, major, I'd call it humanitarian, except it's man-made. Um, and again, sort of like your question, where have we been and how did this happen, um, becomes for me a very, very urgent and burning question that I try to uh, spend as much time thinking about as possible. Anyway, so I'm teaching a course on migration and human rights in Chiapas. I'll take 10 students from NYU, and I will take 25 students, these are all grad students, from other parts of the Americas. So that becomes a place for having a really, for me, interesting and invigorating conversation. They don't have to take it for NYU credit. My students do if they want. Um, the others don't have to take it for credit, or they can take it for uh, credit at their home institution and do it for independent study, and I'll just give the professor the grade and the report. Um, so it's not about a money-making operation. It's really about people who are willing to do interdisciplinary, collaborative, uh, multilingual, uh, super off-sited, you know, off-site work um, together. And so it's been a really incredible experience for me. This is my fourth year doing this. And from the one in 2010, a uh, HEMI graduate student conference started. So that's being done every year. And that's students who first met in that course. So that's been really a wonderful thing. So, I've had a lot doing with that. Then recently, um, I was elected to be uh, president of the MLA. So I'm now the second vice president, and then next year I'll be the first vice president, and then I'll be president. And as I said, it, see, it says it's going to say on my tombstone, it seemed like a good idea at the time. And this is one of the things where I'm always thinking like it seemed like a good idea at the time because now it's like I don't know how I'm going to do all of this. But um, I keep thinking I have a day job, you know. I actually do have to go and teach my students. But um, one of the things, the reason I did it, the reason I accepted it, was because I felt that being in this weird, fabulous, kind of free uh, space in relationship to institutions, that performance studies, my graduate students in performance studies, but also hemispheric, is also kind of on the borders, on the margins of what becomes legible, academically, disciplinarily. And I thought the MLA is a good place as kind of this mammoth organization that thinks about legibility, legitimation, and so forth in institutions to go back to the very center of that place and make the bid for the need for thinking about embodied practice, for the need for thinking about this in relationship to, but not instead of, the things that go through print practice, and to think about it in relationship to, and again, not uh, in opposition to, the things that go through digital practice and the media. So I would like to make these next three years there about trying to bring these forms of knowledge making and production into a productive conversation and hopefully um, being able to leap over one more boundary. I'm hoping no more of these present themselves. I have enough to deal with. Thank you very much. Hello, and thank you for inviting me to UPenn. As a matter of fact, when I was applying to undergraduate schools 45 years ago, this was my first choice. I got in. I went to Brown, but I'll put that in my memoirs, <laughs> why that all happened. But I'm here to talk about rights and reason in the theater. And let me spell that for you, because uh, this happens. People will have it wrong many times, even when they make a request to use our theater. I will get, okay, first of all, it's R-I-T-E-S and reason, R-E-A-S-O-N, which was the name that our founder, George Houston Bass, gave it, using rights as the origins of performance of the theater, and reason being the intellect, being the intelligence that informs the actual creation of, of art and the performance. Sometimes we get reasons 
they go rights and reasons, or this is the one that gets me R-I-G-H-T-S and reason. And I say, we really want to use the rights and reasons space. I say, once you learn how to spell it, then you, you may come back. But what happens, what is unique about rights and reason is that we are uh, a program of the Africana Studies Department at Brown. So we do not live in theater arts taps, as we call it, theater arts and performance studies. The the linkage is through my appointment. My tenure is in theater, but the three quarters of my effort is in Africana studies. We became a department in 2001, but we were founded in 19, where the um, program of Afro-American studies began in 1969. And this is the heyday of the protest era. And I'm giving you this background so you will understand how the, how Rights and Reason grew from being a, uh, a, a loosely organized a student group and to becoming an institution and with the ups and downs of what all of that means because this is a story about the evolution. Well, in uh, December of 1968, there was a black student walkout at Brown. Now at that time, the numbers of black students was about 60. But they dared to think that people gave a damn if the black students left campus. At a time when most campuses, people were protesting on the greens, they were taking over university halls. They said, let's take a chance that people would give a damn, and they actually did. Uh, there was an article in the New York Times during, uh, around that period, uh, and I paraphrase, um, all, uh, uh, Brown offers course in black assertion. And one of the little um, gems in the article was um, almost all of Brown's Negroes walked off of campus. They might as well said they fled the plantation. But they did. And, but soon after that, um, Brown ins instituted something that at that time was called black admissions. And then there was a, um, this effort to increase the black the faculty numbers, but to establish at that time what was called a black studies the program was well, so th by nature a program has a has instructors from various departments so africana studies it continues to be have a interdisciplinary focus and because rights and reason was housed inside of afro m at that time it too grew in terms of being a organically interdisciplinary enterprise so we have that um, a history so what we do, and it's okay, that's the history, but what do you do? We have something called the RPM, which is the Research to Performance Method. Simply, it is that we do research, and I say we, it happens in the classroom with my uh, students, it happens with uh, professional writers, it happens with um, ideas that come from the Providence community members, as well as the greater uh, Rhode Island, and the writer, composer, sometimes team, uh, and, and, and scholars get together and they do research on a certain topic. And then the artists transform that work into accessible and legible artistic product that educates and in sometimes educates and seeks to inspire people to take action. Just um, a real a quick one, one that I did back in 99 that we did again in 2003 in North Carolina was a project called Heart to Heart, which was funded by a lifespan hospitals. And the idea came to us from the Minority Task Force on Heart Disease, which was a task force of the local American Heart Association. And one day, a woman just walked into our space and said, help me, because she says black women are dying at alarming rates due to heart disease and stroke. Um, PSAs are not working. Um, pamphlets are not working. We, said, we heard that you guys do something around research. Well, make it make what we ended up doing. So that was a partnership that came to us from the, the community telling us what they actually needed. We did the research. I wrote the piece. We traveled around to, 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 to 10 sites in Rhode Island, places that were not natural venues. We went into community centers. We went into churches. We went into schools. Um, uh, the Brown Medical School gave us accreditation for the continuing medical education uh, the credits. 
we had uh, a health fair that traveled with this um, performance, <laughs> such that people, uh, they, uh, they gave um, histories on the health, they, they got screened for uh, hypertension, cholesterol, diabetes, and if these people were found to be in any kind of risk, we didn't just say, okay, good luck. We actually said, okay, this is, we're gonna help you. And there was issues around people not having insurance. In, in some cases, there were women who had childcare issues. We had to find ways to address different ethnicities because we had people who were of African descent who did not claim to be blacks, therefore thought they were not at risk. So we had to bust through that line also. We had people who were afraid to come and, and get help because they thought they'd get deported. So I'm, saying, I'm giving that as a very strong example of how we work with the, the community. Uh, what I did um, in the early 2000s to increase my workload, but it was something that I had to do, and that was to put the RPM, the research to performance method, inside of the actual classroom so that we would have an uh, ongoing incubator, but also that's my job is to teach students. I had a lot coming to me. So one uh, semester I found myself with eight independent studies. And you know, that's, that's the definition of insanity. So I said, I need one course. So I created this, uh, this course. And, and out of that, we've done uh, several uh, productions of works by my undergraduate students. And very interestingly enough, they were all done by students, which it was their first time ever writing a play, but they, and we grew from, from uh, the inception of Rights and Reason in, in the 70s from being what I call the black theater to now becoming an Africana theater. Meaning I said, okay, one doesn't have to be British and white to take a course and learn about Shakespeare. So one doesn't have to be African American to take my course, because we teach, well, what I teach is a method so we have done plays about um, foot binding in ancient China. We've done a uh, play about a history of Hawaii. We've done performance about uh, the candle makers of Klex, where young Jewish boys were uh, drafted into the Tsarist army. So we have been able to expand our scope. As we continue to work with the community organizations, especially around issues of health, so these things come to us sometimes organically. And in each case, uh, they were black women who came to us and said, okay, we need you to do something on this, something on that, so to the point now we're getting ready to initiate a project called RPM MedSci. Going back to the anchor play, which was Heart to Heart that I wrote, but then we had a student who did a play called uh, June's Blood, which was about the impact of the Tuskegee Institute on, um, the, um, excuse me, not the Institute, the Tuskegee Experiment, um, but she came at it through the vision of women, how that impacted the lives of three generations of black women. So, so I said, okay, s s something's happening here. We, 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 we are currently in the uh, in process of developing a work called Skips in the Record about Alzheimer's. So we are partnering with the Alzheimer's Association. And then one that's on deck coming up that doesn't yet have a title, but the issue is, is breast cancer among black women. So we kept getting these issues around health and black women. I said, okay, because you know, when you're trying to run an organization, institution, you gotta find the resources to make things happen. So I said, in, instead of trying to find funding for the one project per, let's put it under one umbrella and come at it and partner with people in the medical field, people in the human resource field. So this has been an ongoing evolution of what we do at Rights and Reason. The <laughs> challenges that, that we are now facing is an institutional one. The first big challenge came when the founder, George Houston Bass, died unexpectedly in 1990. And I was one of George's uh, students for 20 years. He was my mentor and he was my friend. And it, this was such a shock. And then I'm working in New York at National Black in the theater after I left this up and coming rising position as an administrative accountant for IBM. Uh, I was recruited to come take George's job and I had no idea I was being schmoozed. I was so clueless because I didn't even think I had the 
the credentials to teach at the, uh, the college level. So when I decided to come in, I understood what the importance was institutionally, being that usually uh, in, in small groups like this, especially, you know, uh, non-white minority or white women groups, gay groups, Latino or Asian, um, whenever the founder, who usually becomes the artistic director, leaves, either, either dies or leaves, the institution dies. So they knew it was very important that this go on, so they got me and I said, okay, fine, I'm gonna come in, I'm gonna give you three years. That was in 1991. I had a head full of black hair. <laughs> 22 years later, I had to send out a, a search party to find a black strand up here anywhere. Something happens, we say it's the water in, in Providence that, that, that keeps you there. But the, uh, and then the other, um, institutional issue that came up was in 2008 when the research director, Red S. Jones, passed away. So uh, after a year, we found out that Brown was not going to, to fund the research director, which is, the, is a critical aspect if you're doing research to and performance work, and we got some kind of excuse around there are enough people on the uh, faculty to do that. But you need somebody to coordinate that. You just don't go through on a list and pick out names. You have to coordinate a whole process and how do these people interface with the artists as a team. So that gave us a clue that said, oh, we can be defunded at any moment at the whim of the university. If we're not, if we're not in favor, if we're not um, you know, in vogue or whatever, we can be defunded. So now that we, we, we are getting older, you know, those of us who were with George in the early days, we're now in our late 50s and 60s. So I said, okay, I, I'm not gonna be alive forever. I'm not going to, you know, I'm not, I'm not gonna be here forever. What's gonna happen when those people who were, who lived the actual experience are not here? So we're at the point now where we are actually dealing with issues of r replenishment and a succession in trying to uh, put together um, a plan to make sure that rights and reason doesn't become a footnote in a history. So that's pretty much our, our overall, um, who we are. But I just want to explain that the issues around diversity, especially, which is an overused word, uh, to, to the point where it doesn't have any meaning, I think. But we didn't go out saying, oh, we need a white person, we need an Asian person, we need a Latino, we need a mixed-blooded person. People came to us because of the quality of our work. So at where we, we're in a space where there's always a program to do this, to, to increase diversity, or, um, or trying to go to the table and beg the powers that be, please let us who do the arts, those of us who are in domains of performance, please let us in this door. So in lieu of going and begging and demanding that we be accepted as full members who have legitimate pedigrees, we, simply have, we just simply do what we say we are. And so we walk into the room and we command it. And that's a big distinction, I think, between saying, please let me in, versus saying, I am already here. Thank you very much. Okay, so um, we have Deb um, half an hour for questions. Thirteen minutes. Okay. Uh, wish for wish wishes. Um, okay, so um, rather than me um, opening up the question, I'm gonna we're gonna jump right to the audience, um, and I'm gonna walk over to you with the microphone so you can ask the question. So we have one right here. Thank you. Thank is that on? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, so my question is, I'm just curious if any of you have any stories, if you could share an experience where perhaps you tried to invite someone in higher administration to come and participate in a project, to be part of the audience or to be a co-collaborator. And we've been talking about how we have all kinds of uphill battles to convince the powers that be at our universities to fund us, to support us, to give us resources, and we make mission statements and vision statements that sort of match the discursive conventions of 
what they expect and hope that the match sounds good and then the money flows. But I'm also wondering to what extent we might be able to solicit people in higher ed administration to be co-creators with us. And <laughs> you know, a lot of things that they need to do. But particularly given the kind of collaborative work that all four of you do and, and very interesting projects that all are designed for multiple modes of participation and audience um, activities, have any of you ever gone that route to invite people to invite people in admin to join your projects, to get a taste of it, to be interlocutors in the trenches of what you do? Thank you. Um, the one example I'd like to give is that our provost at NYU is a mathematician. And um, he's probably close to 70 now. And when I'd go to see him and give him an update on how we were doing at the Hemispheric Institute, and one time I invited him to come down to Mexico, down to Chiapas with me. Uh, we were opening up, I had worked, we had worked with these Mayan women um, to build them a theater and a, and a cultural space with the help of the Ford Foundation. And so I was going down regularly. So for the opening, we were going to invite indigenous women from throughout the Americas to the opening. So I asked him if he wanted to come. He said, sure, he'd come. So he comes down to Chiapas with me. And um, He's, you know, a very serious man and doesn't have, I mean, fake in a test, doesn't have like a lot of broad interest across uh, things, but he came. And so there were all these indigenous women performing and a lot of bare breasts and a lot of raucous behavior and a lot of stuff. And he's sitting there and it just completely transformed him and transformed his appreciation of the project. And I'm not exaggerating, after that, there wasn't anything he wasn't willing to try to do to help us. Not that he could always do it, but he was there and he couldn't believe it. He just couldn't believe it. And so that was, but that was exceptional. In my whole professional life, that's the one time that that has happened. Yeah, I think, uh, I would say, you know, I, th I think of university administrators the same way I think about um, central banker informants, but probably 80% of them wouldn't be perfect partners, but there are some there, right, who are struggling within that space themselves to find meaning and to find, you know, and, and, and the trick is to find those people. So um, we, uh, we've just opened our Korea office, a new Korea office, and the way that it came to be was that I went to Korea to give a, uh, give a talk, give a big lecture, and I uh, had one of those introductory meetings with the president's office, the vice president of the university, Ewa Winston, Women's University was there, and I just gave a sort of three minute thing about what I do, and she said, stop. She said, this is important. I said, yeah. And she said, wait, so tell me, some, wait, say some more about this. And I said, I, so, and then she said, all right, you know what, we're gonna go see the president about this this afternoon. And I thought, you're kidding, right? But, and she has become one of my closest friends. She runs, she mobilized that university and just made it happen, and she said to me, you know, she said, I, I've worked like crazy my entire life. I, I, I practice, you know, I work 20 hours a day. I've built this university. What's my legacy, right? And I need some place to give meaning. And this is the thing that, I, that that's going to make my life worthwhile. So uh, that's not going to happen, again, with everyone by any means. But I, again, I, the only way that we've been successful, I think unlike everyone else is, is so much more illustrious than we are, has been through those personal relationships and somebody deciding that they're willing to throw everything they've got, all the eggs in their basket behind this thing and make it happen. And that's very effective. So I, I think your question is going on. Yeah. Can I just add, um, what, what happened at Brown within the last 10 years was really amazing. So I've been there 22 years and it was very slow in getting support until it was about 2001, 2002 when the previous president, who was very popular, President Ruth Simmons, she was a great, um, a supporter of, of the arts, and through her and, uh, and with a, uh, a major funder, we got a new arts building, the, the, the uh, Granoff building. But what came along with that was the, crea the Creative Arts Council that put all the arts units on campus into an organization, and it's been 
funded quite well. There are things that I know that we at Rights of Reason could not do, like our Black Lavender experience that Mr. Uh, Johnson came to twice, we could not have done. And now there's one more that we're looking at. We're not quite sure what it means, but there's a new associate, a provost level director of the arts. We don't know if that's to have direct communication or is that to have an overseer, but time will tell. Other, que other questions? Uh, oh. Professor Ginsburg? Yeah. Oh, you did you, did you want to respond to the question? I'm happy to chime in. I just felt like people didn't get a chance to talk very quickly. I'll just say, you know, um, I think it's consistent with what everyone else is saying. Don't regard people in the administration as, you know, just I, I invite people to everything. You kind of never know. Um, I do a lot of work with indigenous um, artists and filmmakers from Australia. When we um, work, we work with the Australian consulate. It's a really great time to pull the provost out. The same person Diana's talking about. Um, they love to, you know, hobnob with dignitaries, and then they actually get exposed to amazing things that, as mathematicians or whatever, they don't usually get exposed to, and they get impressed, and then suddenly they have things that they want to talk about with you. So, you know, I think it's just we, because we do creative, lively things, every time you get a chance to just extend an invitation um, to people to, you know, invite them in, I, you know, I think, you know, before they were administrators, they had hearts. <laughs> <laughs> and loves and other things. You know, I found out like our dean, a social science dean who's an economist, like loved Jean Rouge because when he was in Istanbul growing up, like he went to a cine club in somebody's basement. I mean, like you just never know until you start schmoozing with people in the coffee shop where your allies are. So um, I think I'm just supporting what everyone else is saying. Like, you know, talk to people, assume they could be your friends, figure out where the points of connection are, collaborate like crazy. Um, um, unfortunate. I have, I have a, I think, face hearing me three times. Yeah, it's okay. I have a bad memory, so I don't remember. So my so question, I'm impressed by the sustainability of all of the projects here. I'm wondering what kind of both the collaborative part and the archiving part, and I'm wondering what kind of infrastructure, and I'm particularly interested in digital infrastructure that is enabled both your practice and the sharing of it, and what you imagine needing to sustain it kind of in the next phase of things. And that was just really important to me that people be able to speak and participate in their own languages. So we built a platform which, uh, in which People can read messages and participate uh, it, on their iPhones or whatever, but they can e everyone can read it and participate in their own language. And behind that, of course, is not a machine. It's, there's a bunch of grad students who, are with P or people with PhDs, who really understand the conversation. Because I, I don't think that I just don't believe that a, a machine can do the same thing as a, 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 a somebody who really understands what the conversation is about. Um, so that's one thing we, we've we've been approached by Google to say why don't we like to fund you know, no no this is ethnography it's not you know computer science um, um, I think um, I I actually think you have a, it's a great question I'm not satisfied though I, I feel really dissatisfied with uh, the online format still like I just feel that it's not the same kind of conversation so far and I'm not quite sure what to do about that I mean the benefit of the online portion is that it slows it down. My fear was, you know, Americans talk a lot, and especially lawyers talk a lot, and they talk, they're loud, and they, they take up the whole stage, and when you're dealing in a cross-cultural situation, I was really worried about the marginalization of certain voices, so I thought if text would be one way to slow that process down, but there are other problems with that, so I'm really interested in what other technologies we might be able to use that would enable, force the loudmouth American lawyers to to listen, and that's actually, it's a real, it's a serious question. So I'm gonna take it from a different angle, which is the long-term preservation of all these materials. And we have been very lucky at HEMI to have a partnership with NYU Libraries. So the, the HIDVL, which is the Hemispheric Institute Digital Video Library, which has all of these materials, 
um, was funded by the Mellon Foundation, and the idea was, I mean, Mellon always, the thing with Mellon is you have to give to get, right? Mellon's very clear about that. And so their thing was NYU had to sustain it, had to contribute the 100 hours of making it, you know, growing every year, and had to sustain it into perpetuity. So that collection is into perpetuity. They have to sustain that, which is fantastic, because otherwise, what's the point of laboring like that to create these works? Now, um, our website is also part of a special collection for NYU, because that was one of the things I was insisting on, because we have so many materials. We have our journals, we have our books, we have all of these materials that why do all of this online if it's not going to be sustained? So the, I mean, there's still going to be huge problems, right? Because the platforms are going to be changed. I mean, that's, maybe we'll be able to sustain the content, but not the, obviously not the platforms. Um, so what are we, and so we're working on that constantly, but there's no solution to that. And that's something that we'll keep inventing as we go along. But the fact that we have institutional support to think that through and to work on those issues is huge, right? Because, you know, it's been such an investment of time and energy into producing and creating all of that. <coughs> Archiving is, is critical. We're actually, in uh, Rights and Reason, we're actually uh, four years into an archiving project that we are working on with um, USC because they have the state of the art digitization pro process that because because of the Shoah Foundation. So we have we've already digitized about a hundred hours of material that only covers a p certain category over ten years. So uh, I'm, I'm working with our people in media productions and with our librarian. So that we, what we're trying to do is build a case to take it to the university because we have 45 years of of stuff mixed media. Obviously, we get to a certain year, everything is going to be on a slide or a photograph, lots of paper, and we need a space to house all that. But we, we are very lucky at least to be in that process so that we said, okay, only way to get the kind of big money is for the university to, to go after it because we can't afford to do it. But yeah, that's, a, that's a, I'm glad you raised the question. I wanted to raise that. Thank you. Yeah. Professor uh, Ginsburg? Yeah, I could just chime in. Um, Diane and I have a, we often coordinate a lot or are using similar resources. Um, because we're known as a center for indigenous media, both scholarship and curation and exhibition, and we've and had so many uh, fellows come from all over the world who are indigenous media makers. Um, this is sort of a sad story, but we can also be as kind of in, this, in a different way than Diana, but in a similar sentiment. Um, the National Museum of the American Indians Film and Video Center in New York City, which is an incredible resource and has a, a huge collection from across the Americas of film and video, um, is being shut down by the Smithsonian because they decided to sacrifice that for, for the budget cuts that came across this year for Smithsonian institutions. And because of the library's amazing support of Mellon projects that Diana mentioned, uh, we, were able, we had a meeting about three weeks ago and we're going to actually transfer and upgrade the whole collection and make it a study collection at NYU. Um, which, you know, so we, it's really, we've had these very long-term partnerships across the city with these different institutions, and that's one of them, and it's come to fruition, and we're just very um, fortunate that we can help rescue that collection and make it available to our students. So that's a, another kind of, you know, in addition to archiving our own work, and I think Diana's point of the impossible, <laughs> uh, the platforms are constantly changing if you're not upgrading. I have a really big uh, study collection of films from all the different kinds of projects we've initiated, and, you know, we're constantly having to upgrade and change their files and all that. It's a bit of a nightmare. I think that... Um, these kinds of things that we do, they, the, the labor has really accelerated because of the demands of digital platforms and social media communication. And while that's also enhanced our uh, capacity to do the work we do, I think we all struggle under the increased workload and increased need for funding. These are very expensive uh, modes of communication and preservation that need a huge amount of infrastructure. And I think it's a, a you know, a problem that we all face in different ways. We're constantly running to keep up with the costs of maintaining our own uh, histories, so to speak. Thank you. Um, I want to thank the panelists. This was a really wonderful panel. I want to thank you, the audience. Um, and we're going to move on to our next um, session.
Thank you so much. To the camera workshop. Excellent. Sure, it's um, Sophia, what's your email address? Hi everyone, we're gonna take about three minutes to just kind of set up and get ourselves organized. If you wanna stretch your legs and go to the bathroom and then come back. No, 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 no stretching of legs. Just know that we're gonna take three to five minutes, yes. <laughs> no stretch. We could also flip for coffee break. We're ready for everyone, if you could take your seats. Okay, cool. All right, thank you. Please stand by. 
Hello? I missed it. Is this on? I was like 30 seconds late. <laughs> Come on, camera press. See, I knew that. I suggested to Dad, like, maybe we put in a coffee break now and then come back. But she was like, no, things are already started. You know you're going to go over it every single time. I mean, you just have to build in 30 minutes over. Which I feel is like the entirety of this workshop. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, exactly. So you have to build that in there to know that you can be yeah. late. You know? Yeah. Why don't you start? Should I start? And just as people trickle in, talk about camera. You think so? No, I think you should. I think. Because it's 2.44, we have 15 minutes. Only 15 minutes? It's from. It was from 2 to 2. I'm sorry. It started at 